Okay. Um, I'm Louis Malmadrona, and I'll be joined um, periodically by Barbara Mangi and Patrick McFarlane. And um, Albert Marshall was going to join us, but apparently they're having internet problems on his First Nation in Nova Scotia. So he may or may not uh, solve those and join us today. But uh, I'm, I'm happy to be here, happy to be sharing thoughts with those of you who are present in real time with me, and also happy to be speaking to those of you that will listen to this session on demand. And um, also, I just want to express my gratitude to Jennifer um, Say, I hope I'm saying that right, uh, a colleague who is there in Baltimore, making it possible for us to speak with you um, virtually. And I thank the Anthropological Association for inviting us and allowing us to speak. So, um, I want to begin by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you from Orono, Maine, the unceded uh, tribal lands of the Penobscot Nation. And I want to acknowledge their land claims and um, to acknowledge their elders past, present, and future. Uh, and I, I want to invite us to have a dialogue because that would be more fun than me just talking for a long time. So Nicole, please, free to, please feel free to join in. And Jennifer, you as well, and Barbara and Patrick and anyone else who happens to show up. So um, colonization is, is not new. And in fact, this castle that you're looking at is the result of the French king, Louis I in Paris, sending one of his relatives to colonize the, the area of the Occitania in France in order to extract its mineral wealth and, and take it all back to Paris. And so um, colonization is, a, is certainly a global phenomenon. And uh, now, of course, the castle is a wonderful tourist attraction, as is the <laughs> wonderful quaint streets where you can see Barbara standing in front of one of our favorite um, bric-a-brac shops in all the world in Najac, France. So um, we are grateful to Albert for originating this idea of two-eyed seeing that we'll use to, to talk about decolonization. And of course, we continue to acknowledge the Wabanaki, uh, the people of the dawn. And interestingly, Aki means people and Waban means white. So um, people of the whiteness, you might say. And, and uh, it, I thought it was interesting because in Lakota, uh, the word for creator is Dakushkashka, which means the whitest, whitest of the of the of that that which is the whitest, whitest. And so, I suppose Don is white, in some manner of speaking. Um, so, my exposure to colonization happened at Stanford University School of Medicine. And I can tell you that I had no idea what I was entering into. I grew up in a, in a environment of, of healing and, and healers uh, until my mother married a, a German farmer and we moved to his farm. Uh, but my grandmother stayed with us and told stories and, and um, it was 
in my early um, childhood that traditional healers helped me with my asthma, though I did partake of some conventional medicine. So for the most part, we couldn't afford it. And um, so um, what, is it, what does it mean to talk about colonization and healthcare? And um, I draw upon um, the author of The Mushroom at the End of the World, which uh, some of you may have read. Her, her, her name is Singh, and she writes about Matsutake mushrooms. <clears throat> but um, within that book is a brilliant passage on the way in which Europe um, created plantations, initially sugar cane in the Caribbean, and um, worked cr to create scalable enterprise. And the way that was done was to bring in a monoculture of sugar cane. So um, all of the cane was of one genetic stock cloned from a, an original parent. And um, the labor problem was solved by um, killing the locals and bringing in slaves from Africa who wouldn't have known where to escape to if they could have escaped and had no relatives in, in the region. <clears throat> and um, the goal was to have a process in which the being or the beingness of the workers didn't matter, um, which I think Marx called alienation and to have interchangeable workers so that one worker was as good as another and so that the plantation could grow or upscale without having to change anything about the way things were done. And um, next came uh, the sugar mills, which forced the, the workers to keep up with the production rate of the mills. So how does that relate to Stanford University School of Medicine? So instead of sugarcane, we have people's bodies. And instead of slaves from Africa, we have medical students, residents, and attendings. And, um, and we have to keep up with the needs for, rev the need for revenue. So there's a need for X number of heart transplants per month and, and Y number of cardiac bypasses per month and Z number of cardiac stents per month. And everyone has productivity quotas. A certain number of patients must be seen per hour. And it, Income is maximized when time spent with patients is minimized. And so what does that mean? It means that relationship is removed from the equation. So, so get the least information possible to do the job. Um, preferably prescribe a medication because um, that's profitable and get in, get out as quickly as you can. There's a whole literature on preventing doorknob complaints. When people tell you things at the end of the visit, when your hand is on the doorknob and you're trying to leave and the thing that they really came for finally comes up. So, um, so this is, this is uh, the plantation mentality applied to healthcare. And um, it, it doesn't seem to actually be working. And why do I say that? Well, because the US spends um, two to four times more money on healthcare than any other country. And the last time we looked, we ranked in the, in the 50s on 
uh, health indices. And so apparently um, our particular brand of healthcare capitalism isn't producing health outcomes, but it is highly profitable. So um, healthcare conglomerates are making enormous amounts of money. Big Pharma is making enormous amounts of money. Um, and uh, vice presidents, CEOs, senior vice presidents um, are making high salaries. So um, the system is working. However, um, not necessarily for the goal of health. And, and so, um, so what's my interest in this? Um, my interest is, is in wondering how would indigenous people have invented healthcare if we could have invented healthcare? What, what would it look like? Well, um, Sarah, it would include ceremony. And um, I remember sitting in pharmacology class at Stanford and the, one of the uh, discoverers of the metabolic syndrome was giving us a lecture. And he told us that life was a relentless progression toward death, disease, and decay. And the job of the physician was to slow the rate of decline. And in that moment, I knew I needed an indigenous perspective on health and disease. And as soon as the lecture ended, I ran across campus to the Stanford Indian Center, burst through the door. Who, was, who did I encounter but Henrietta Blue Eyes? And I ran up to her desk and I said, Henrietta, I need an elder. She pulled out an archaic artifact called a Rolodex and, and asked, what tribe? And I said, Cherokee, which is my mother's lineage. And she had two names for me and I was spending time with one of them by the next weekend. So um, two-eyed seeing. I got through medical school through seeing the Stanford world and the indigenous world at the same time. I didn't decolonize anyone as a medical student, I assure you of that, but I had fantasies of how it might happen. And um, I, I, it, would, it would include ceremony. And one of, the, one of the studies that we did and all the studies that I'll talk about can be found on Scholar Google if you simply type in my last name. Um, but one of the studies we did was to ask traditional elders, um, how they thought healthcare workers should be trained. And uniformly, they agreed that spirituality needed to be a part of healthcare and that ceremony was crucial to healthcare. So this is, this is a structure for an Anipi. And I suspect, I don't need to explain this to anthropologists that you've You've seen this, you've probably read um, Bucko's book, The Lakota Sweat Lodge Ceremony, which was his dissertation at the University of Nebraska. Um, Bucko set out to find out what was the right way to do this ceremony. And he discovered that there isn't a right way, that it's done differently in every place that it's done by the people who do it. And um, he concluded, when in Porcupine, do it the way they do it, but in Kyle, do it their way, and in Martin, do it yet a third way. And actually, it's, it's kind of interesting, too, because the Lakota language even changes between Martin, Porcupine, and Kyle as well, which was an observation that Albert Whitehead Sr. made um, in teaching Lakota language at uh, Santa Glashka College. <clears throat> so, so if we were to decolonize healthcare, it would include ceremony. And uh, at my first 
Anipi, which was, I think, in 1972, there was a Roman Catholic priest there. And doing this ceremony was against the law in 1972. And Father Stone was there to put on his collar if the police appeared and to declare what we were doing a proper Roman Catholic ritual. He said, well, it's kind of like baptism, he said, just a little different. And who needs to know the difference? So um, Father Stone had two eyed seeing. He was able to see with the indigenous eye and with the Roman Catholic eye at the same time. Though he confided in me that he thought all things considered, he preferred the indigenous spirituality. But um, that was him. And uh, this is another kind of ceremony um, that could be included if we were to decolonize. This is Native American church. Native American church happens in a teepee um, around a fire. It's an all night ceremony. It was invented in the late 19th century. And um, it, was a com it was invented as a combination of indigenous spirituality and Christianity. The songs are in Northern Cheyenne. And it, it, to, to my ear, it, it's slightly odd to hear um, the word Jesus being sung intermittently in Northern Cheyenne. And um, I put that, I put this in because our friend Becky developed pancreatic cancer. And she went to the Indian Health Service Hospital in Rapid City and was told to, basically there was nothing they could do, you know, to get her affairs in order. And so uh, a number of us, mobilized resources for Becky, including Native American Church. And um, this is a, a picture of a leader, which is called a roadman um, from the inside. And the beauty of this ceremony is that it's designed so that if the police were to show up, everything could be converted into something that looked like they were sitting around a fire cooking. And so the drums, the drums that you can see are water drums and you take off the top and you use these um, sticks, decorated sticks to stir a pot of water if the, if the authorities show up. And uh, it, it, it's incredibly designed to, to convert in an almost transformers the movies sequence um, from one scenario to the other. And um, so Be Becky um, misplaced her cancer. I don't know where it went. Maybe somebody's looking for it, but I don't think anybody really wanted to find it. Um, and the really fascinating thing is that they wouldn't talk about it at the Indian Health Service Hospital. It was, a, it was just a, we will not discuss this. This did not happen. We will not listen. We will not look. We will not speak about it. End of story. And um, this is why we need to decolonize healthcare because indigenous people in this country are invisible to the mainstream. Um, not to anthropologists, I might add, <laughs> but to mainstream medicine. It, um, and so, so now I wanna talk a little bit about Albert Marshall's perspective. And in terms of, of mental health, indigenous people have been concerned with mental health for a really long time. And we are dismissed by positivist biomedical psychiatry as unscientific and not evidence-based. And that um, from a two-eyed seeing perspective, maybe we do have something to offer the modern world. And um, so Albert 
came forth to promote this idea that indigenous knowledge is as valid as contemporary scientific knowledge. And that it's not necessarily just for indigenous people. Um, maybe it's for everyone, but he certainly thought it was important for other marginalized populations, people who hear voices, immigrants, homeless people, um, you name it. And this photo, by the way, is the entrance to our Sundance grounds on the Cheyenne River Reservation in South Dakota. The sign says Pejuta Ishnala Naji, which means medicine that stands alone. And um, so the term for two-eyed seeing in Albert's language is eptuoptomonk. And um, it was used to create an integrative science program at Cape Breton University in the fall of 2004. And the goal, Albert's goal was to help us appreciate the wisdom of the indigenous world. And Albert believes, as I do, that indigenous wisdom is needed for human survival. Um, that that <clears throat> there are limits to growth in a finite world and that we need to transform from global competition to global collaboration if, we're, if humans are to survive. Though I'm, I'm betting on the raccoons taking over because of their opposable thumbs. So, um, so Eptuopta monk, leave the world a better place than you found it. And that's a really important teaching. Uh, and Albert would say it should extend for seven generations. So in Lakota, seven generations would be 20 times seven, but in Mi'kmaq, it would be 840 years. So, so they're more forward and backward thinking, you might say. They have a wider span of concern. Here's a photo of Albert in case he's not able to join us. Um, and similar uh, related to Eptuoptamunk is Netukolimk. And this is the idea that we're all interdependent and interconnected. And the key concepts are coexistence, interrelatedness, um, embeddedness in community. And, and um, it reminds me of there's a developing literature on uh, humans as nature in, and as opposed to um, humans as apart from nature. And it's um, entirely consistent with indigenous philosophy to think of all aspects of the world as having ontological validity. So rocks have the same ontological status as humans, as animals, as trees, as mountains. Um, everything has a spirit and um, everything is worthy of respect and acknowledgement. And um, so, um, so two-eyed seeing is evolving and the number of papers using two-eyed seeing in the title is exponentially uh, growing and we want to look at it as, as a methodology for looking at consciousness, awareness, and um, suffering. Because the, um, the project of healing would be unnecessary if people weren't suffering, if they weren't in distress. And so we want to look at indigenous concepts of suffering and of healing, how one recovers from a state of suffering. And um, in getting there, 
Um, we have to acknowledge that what consists of academic knowledge these days is largely positivist, objective, linear, hierarchical, and um, empirical. And so indigenous knowledge, however, is also peer reviewed, that it's consensus driven and that it's evidence-based, that it comes from systematic observations of how things work and that it doesn't need to make sense to the dominant paradigm to be effective and practical. So um, it's the opposite of positivism, which says that there is one cause and science will find it. And of course, in psychiatry, we're looking at molecular explanations for people's suffering as the one cause. And also the idea that there's only one there's only one explanation and the right explanation excludes all other explanations. So there can't be more than one. Um, and I mentioned the reductionism, that the best theory is the most fundamental microstructural theory. And so um, within the biomedical paradigm, we're more concerned with the neural circuitry involved in depression and the related neurochemicals, then we are in talking about why relationship makes people feel better. We're more interested in the brain circuitry of meditation than the beneficial effects of meditation. So, um, so we want to embrace explanatory pluralism, which is what two-eyed seeing is all about. And of course, we, we could have called it mini-eyed seeing, but um, Albert wanted to emphasize the, in, the indigenous perspective being raised to equality with the, science, the contemporary scientific perspective. And so I wanna speak to one of Albert's favorite examples, which is, not an example from the mental health field, but an example from um, geophysics. So um, here in Maine, uh, we have the Bay of Fundy. And the Bay of Fundy has the highest tides in the world. So water goes up and down more than any other place in the world. And um, so a story appeared about 3,400 years ago to explain the high tides in the Bay of Fundy. And here's how the story goes. Luscap needed to take a bath. Luscap is the cultural hero of the Wabanaki people. And he's rather large. And so an ordinary bathtub would not really provide accommodations for Blue Scap. And you can, you can get some sense for his size if you ever drive through Truro, Nova Scotia and take a look at the giant statue of Blue Scap at the Truro truck stop on, the, on where the road forks to go to Sydney or Halifax. So um, Beaver built the most amazing dam that the world has ever seen across this narrow isthmus. And it was just perfect for Glooscap to take a bath, to step over the dam and to lie down and take a nice bath. And the water was much warmer in those days. You know, um, before those days, there were swordfish in the Bay of Fundy because it was so warm. Now, Whale got upset. Whale said, wait a minute, you guys, this is one of my favorite feeding grounds. The, 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 the stuff to eat in here is just fabulous. And, and you're blocking my entrance. And Glooskap, being an altruist as, as he was, said, oh, I'm sorry, Whale. I didn't, I didn't realize that um, this was important to you. 
we'll take the dam down. Whereupon Beaver said, no way, no how, it's a wonder of the architectural world. We're not taking this dam down. At which point with one gigantic slap of its tail, whale caused the dam to go crashing down and the tides to start surging in and out. And it's been going on that way ever since. So what's the geophysical explanation? Well, it turns out that 3,400 years ago, there was a perfect storm. Two underwater volcanoes in the Gulf of Maine erupted at the same time that a hurricane came through and massive winter melting runoff occurred. And this combination of hurricane runoff and volcanic eruption caused the collapse of this narrow isthmus of land blocking the entrance to this bay and starting causing the cold water to surge in from deeper seas. And it's been continuing that way ever since. So Albert would say, which story is right? And he would smile and say, they're both right. And they're both good. Now, I personally prefer the whale tale. I think it's a lot more fun, but, um, but they're both interesting and useful. And, and so we, we don't want to reduce people you know, to the molecular levels, to being an assembly of nerve cells and associated molecules. Um, we want to propose an anti-reductionist account that um, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts and that we have to look to, um, we have to look to the horizon to understand mind and mental health. That, that mind, that consciousness exists and that mind as a function of consciousness arises from the relationships that each being has with all of the other beings in its environment. And past, present, and future beings, um, beings from other dimensions, um, beings that can move themselves, beings that cannot move themselves. And so, um, so to understand mind, we have to understand all the relationships in, in which a person engages. And, um, well, I, I'll talk about, I'll get the studies in just a minute. Um, so, um, so what would that, what would that look like? You know, it would look like saying that um, we, we must look to, to a person's relationship with this, with beings in the spiritual realm. That we have to look to a person's relationships um, with beings in the human realm. We have to look to a person's relationships with the animals and the plants and the mountains and the rocks and the rivers and the trees and all of the living beings because all beings are living. And we have to look to a person as embedded in a community of relationships. And how do humans manage relationships? They manage through stories. So it's because of stories that we know how to relate to each other. And um, so stories tell us how to behave. So story would be the basic building block of mind. And um, I'm gonna skip over some of our studies because they're all on Scholar Google. Um, so 
we're forged so the this perspective is that we arise as an emergent property of all of the relationships in which we're embedded and that we that stories tell us how to manage these relationships and stories tell us what is the purpose of life why are we here what are we supposed to be doing here stories tell us to whom we belong and and when we share enough of the same stories we feel that we belong you know because we we have a shared frame of reference <clears throat> joanne archibald wrote a marvelous book called indigenous story work and she talks about the seven principles of indigenous story work, which is respect, responsibility, reciprocity, reverence, holism, interrelatedness, and synergy. And, and these are the values that should guide the decolonization of mental health. And um, I've, I've never felt more respected than when I sit with an elder. And I've never felt more heard. I, I, one of the most powerful experiences I had was sitting with Vern Harper, who was the resident elder at the Center for Addictions and Mental Health, the largest such hospital in Canada, which is located in Toronto. And, um, Vern listened without judgment or interpretation, and he listened as long as I would speak. And wow, is that fabulous. And that's what we need to do for each other, that we need um, respect, that, that we need to understand that those who are suffering are doing so on behalf of all of us, that um, the Dene in Arizona and New Mexico believe that so strongly that um, they believe that if someone's sick, everyone needs to contribute um, energetically and financially to the ceremony to help them get well. Because if not for them, someone else would be there. That we're all responsible for the suffering of others reciprocity, that we help each other. And I, I think reciprocity speaks against what's called professionalism, which is a way of objectifying the other and, and um, separating from the other. And um, well, it's a way of othering, one might say, because in, in professionalism, um, we say, you know, I'm an expert and you are not. And I'm going to treat you, I'm going to look at you as an object. I'm going to produce an objectified gaze upon you. And as an object, uh, I'm going to do what I do to you and um, you should like it. Um, so um, maybe, we need more reciprocity and less professionalism. Reverence, the understanding that everyone is sacred, everything is sacred. Holism, that um, all, all relationships and the effects of those relationships should be considered in, in mental health because we are interrelated and that there's a synergy that happens when people come together. So, um, so we've talked about this. Um, in Lakota, the Nagi is um, the swarm around the, the physical body of everything that influences that being. And I think of it as a swarm of all the stories that have been told or being told or will be told about this 
being. And every spark, every story contains a spark of the being who told that story. And all stories are told within community. And stories are carried by elders. Um, and there are protocols for elders, for dealing with elders. I'm sorry. So, um, so this is the notion of circular knowledge, the horizon, um, thinking about um, emotional, spiritual, physical, mental, um, and also realizing that in, in, the, in most indigenous languages in North America, so well-being is not siloed as it is in English. So it's all one. It's all about wellness. Um, Wichozani is the word in Lakota. And um, so balance, harmony. And when things are out of balance and harmony, suffering can ensue. And so what that means is that if we're truly going to decolonize um, healthcare, that we need to remove the separations between psychology, psychiatry, internal medicine, um, all of social work, all of the various specialties that have, that have arisen and um, claim their territory, claim their um, intellectual territory. And so I, I wanna tell a couple of stories about um, sort of mental health indigenous style that can inspire us perhaps um, to think about how would we decolonize. <clears throat> John Charles was a, an elder I knew um, who lived on Sturgeon Lake, First Nation. And he um, was a very interesting character because for uh, 40 years or so, he'd been an Anglican priest. And when he was 60 years old, he, he was diagnosed with a malignant brain tumor and was told um, there was nothing that could be done and um, go home, uh, just like Becky and, and previously, go home and get your affairs in order. So he was in a quandary because he'd been doing the Anglican way for quite a while, but people were telling him about a, a Cree woman he should go see, uh, and John was Cree, um, a Cree woman he should go see who might be able to help him. And, and he, he didn't know what to think of this, but he decided he better go. And lo and behold, his tumor wandered off as well. And, um, and so, then he was really in a quandary. And he thought, well, the, it was the Cree way that helped me. But I spent all these years doing the Anglican way. What, are, what am I to think? And, and he had a dream. He dreamed of Christ on the cross. And the cross looked like a Sundance tree. And there were four elders in each of the directions smoking their chanupa or sacred pipe for those directions. And when he awoke, he realized it was all one. There was no separation. He could, do, he could be both. He didn't have to choose. He could just do his own thing in a two-eyed way, which was unique to him. And <clears throat> um, I loved going to his, his ceremonies I have to say, um, he never once mentioned Jesus, but he did have a kind of, of um, tacky portrait of Jesus tacked to a tree behind his anipi structure, his, his uh, lodge uh, for the revitalization ceremony uh, with purple cloth hanging from it. So, um, so that was John Charles and um, 
I loved John because he, he held a clinic every Sunday morning. And if something ailed you, he would just come open his door and walk into his living room. And um, just to give a sense of indigenous uh, country, the TV would be blaring and children would be running in and out, yelling and teenagers would be grumpily cooking themselves breakfast in the kitchen, not far removed. And, and John would come get people and bring them into his um, treatment room and uh, do his doctoring. And when he was done, he would bring them back to that um, common area where everybody talked to everybody else about what ailed them. And, a lot of healing happened in that common area. It was a healing room and not a waiting room. And um, so um, I, li I, I like to tell the story of injuring my knee. I realize this is not a mental health story, but it gives one a sense of how John worked. And coming to see John, I, I was on crutches and John, when I walked in, John said, uh, I had a dream about you. I, I knew you hurt your knee and, and I know what happened. I said, what happened? He said, you were cursed. And, and he described the person who had cursed me. And I thought, well, it seems pretty accurate. <laughs> I could believe that. And so he said, well, the way that you deal with the curse is you have to pray harder for them, for their well-being, than they're praying for your bad being. He said, so, so we're gonna pray hard together for this person's well-being. And so we went into the little room and, and he sang some songs and, and we prayed hard for this person. And then he, he threw a sheet over me and he took an iron skillet and filled it with sage and, lit it on fire and shoved it under this under the sheet. I almost died of asphyxia. Well, he sang the Lord's Prayer song in Cree. <laughs> so um, finally, he, he pulled off the sheet and um, he gave me a kind of, of, of charm, an amulet, a sort of a, a thing to hang on my truck's rear view mirror. And he said, this will protect you from the curse and it'll also prevent speeding tickets. I didn't try, I didn't test the speeding ticket because I was afraid of the RCMP myself um, or as the locals call them, the government racing cars, the GRC. So um, my knee got a lot better. I went back the next week and John said, well, that curse was stronger than I thought. He said, you need another doctoring. So this time it was even more intense than the last time. And the amulet was bigger. And this one went on my, the front door of my house. And by the next weekend, my knee was fine. And I went skiing with my son. So, um, so what would John say about how would he relate to mental health problems? Well, he might think of, he might have the same explanation. It might be a curse. It might be a, a, a spirit that, that wandered in or got let in that was an unhealthy one. It might be the result of trauma. John believed that trauma opened the door for all kinds of nasty energies to come into someone. <clears throat> it, could, it could be from imbalance, you know? And uh, we had a friend who drank a case of Dr. Pepper every day. And I tried to convince this guy that he, you know, it might not be healthy for him. And he said, no, I said, I'm praying over it. He said, it's healthy for me because I pray over it. Well, it, it turned out not to be healthy <laughs> and he had a stroke, which sad. But, and John, what John said is that, you know, balance and harmony, you can't overcome a, a, 
an imbalanced relationship with the world of, of drinks through an over-reliance on the world of spirits. You got to balance the two. And, and, you know, there's a limit to what the spirits can do for you. You got to do some things for yourself. And um, so, um, so that was some of his perspective on mind and, and mental health. And next, I, I want to talk about Melvin Gray Fox, who lived in North Dakota. And um, I, I liked hanging out with Melvin. Um, so um, elders need roadies to carry their stuff. And they're, they're sort of like, I used to jokingly say that the, the, the elders were like the rock stars of Indian country, that, you know, that they had us, you know, following them around. And um, Melvin, Melvin's daughter had married a, a Canadian um, airman um, because he'd been on temporary duty at one of the Air Force bases in North Dakota. And, well, they have dances and th one thing leads to the next and you never know what will happen to these young people if you let, let them off on their own. Well, in this case, they got married and um, there was a, a triple suicide in, in the, the young man's home community. And they didn't, they didn't have anyone who felt um, up to the task of doctoring the community and the people who were affected. So they called Melvin. And Melvin said to a couple of us, well, you wanna go to British Columbia? <laughs> I said, sure, why not? <laughs> so off we went and uh, it was cold, it's cold up there. And um, so Melvin was doing what's called a UEP ceremony. UEP means they tie them up and um, it was a ceremony that came to horn chips in a vision around 1868. And it was supposed to cure white people disease. And um, it, it became pretty popular. And it's a lot like the shaking tent ceremony that's done in Ojibwe or Anishinaabe country. And the leader, is, uh, his, his hands are tied behind his back and he's wrapped up in a star quilt and he's put in the middle of a, of a um, um, I guess you would say, in French it would be an hotel. Um, and um, there's 405 pieces of cloth filled with tobacco on strings that are placed around him in a square. And, um, and the room is pitch dark, the lights go off and the singing and drumming starts and wild and amazing things happen. And when the lights come back on, the leader is untied and he proceeds to doctor the people who need doctoring. So uh, this was the ceremony we were doing and we were preparing for the ceremony. We were getting ready and um, we were, um, you know, it was a one stop town. There was a grocery store, you know, kind of like a general store and a garage and an Anglican church and, uh, you know, a, a kind of a, place full of junk cars or you could get parts and um, not a lot else, you know? And we were, we were hanging out in the general store waiting to, for the time to go to the ceremony because you know, it started until it's dark. And what do we hear outside but kabam, kabam. And we run out to look and there's a guy in camouflage outfit hollering. I want to be an Indian. I want to be an Indian. And, um, you know, and then he loaded again, kabam, kabam, I want to be an Indian. I want to be an Indian. And um, 
Well, that was scary. And um, Melvin walked right out to the guy and said, if you want to be an Indian, give me that there shotgun. He did. And then Melvin looked at me and he said, um, he told the guy to go and sit in the back of the pickup truck. And then he looked at me and he said, you're the damn psychiatrist, go sit with him. <laughs> so I did. <laughs> and I, and to, to, to use a technical term, he was completely nutters. And um, Melvin he took him to the ceremony. We went to the ceremony. Melvin gave him a drum and said, he said, keep, keep good time. Beat on this drum in good time. You know, keep the beat going. He did. And this was in the days before passports were needed to cross the border. And in those days, we kept a collection of driver's licenses so that if anybody needed one, we would give them a driver's license, you know? And as long as it looks sort of like them, nobody really cared, especially crossing into North Dakota. <laughs> so it was sort of one of those, if you wanna to go to North Dakota, you should be able to. So we found one that sort of looked like him and, and he went home with Melvin. And Melvin, um, there, there was a, a, a woman in Melvin's community whose husband had died and, and her children had all moved away and she had no one to look after her and do chores for her. And, and Melvin told this guy, he said, look, if you wanna be an Indian, you gotta look after my neighbor and and if you do, I'll teach you all the songs and, and you can learn language. Who knows, you know, maybe you'll be an Indian. Well, that's the last I heard of that until four years later, I ran into him in the Denver airport and I didn't recognize him, you know? And he said to me, hey, remember me? Of course I said, uh, yeah. And he said, yeah, I'm that crazy guy that wanted to be an Indian. He said, and, and Melvin says, I'm no longer a schizophrenic, I'm an Indian now. And so he, he changed labels and uh, he was doing well. And uh, wouldn't that be great if we could take people in and take them home and give them meaning and purpose and belonging and watch them get better instead of putting them in hospitals and drugging them and um, putting them in little boxes called apartments and, and isolating them and, and um, you know, um, alienating them from the community. When I, I, I used to work in Northern Saskatchewan and we would try very hard not to send people south. Not because if they went south, say to Saskatoon um, or Prince Albert, to the regional psychiatric center. If they went south, they'd get labeled. And if they stayed there long enough, they wouldn't be able to live in the north because the label would prevent them from ever recovering. And I was able to watch people have psychotic episodes. And, and I went there once a month and it was like time-lapse photography. I would watch, I would see them better and better and better and better and finally back to normal without drugs with being surrounded by family and and um being protected and being loved and um it was really an amazing lesson in what mental health services could be and none of the people who were providing the services were professionals this was, this was innate to the community. It was organic. People just came together and did what needed to be done. And people got better. <clears throat> so, um, so what would it look like? <clears throat> <clears throat> well, you know, I think that we would have, we would create villages where people can improve, where they can go to be safe and contained, but not detained and not imprisoned. And, you know, with, with respect, but with protection. And, um, you know, we have a fantasy of doing that here in Wabanaki country 
by um, with with tiny houses or airstream uh, trailers and building a little community uh, um, that that can be staffed by peer counselors you know with with um, availability of you know psychiatry if necessary um, traditional healers um, counselors who who know the culture um, language songs ceremonies and and for people to be able to stay um, as long as they wish as long as they need to and this just came up for with us today we needed a safe place for someone to go and and we couldn't get them into the crisis center and we knew that going to the psychiatric hospital would be terribly detrimental for them and we have no place for them to go that's culturally syntonic and healing at the same time so um so elders told me this is this comes from an elder in washington state uh, and he said to me that each of us are spirit beings come to walk in the physical world. And when we're sitting around um, in spirit world, it looks a lot easier than it is to, to take on a life in this ordinary world. And sometimes he said, we bite off more than we can chew and, and we suffer for it. We're wounded. Um, we're traumatized. And, and he said that it's like what they do in Japan. You know, when, when something breaks, when a pot breaks, they mend the break with gold. And he said, and that's healing. It's mending the wounds with gold. <clears throat> and that's what we need to be doing for each other. So, um, so part of this decolonization is overthrowing the DSM. DSM is a, it's like a, a textbook of botany. You know, it comes right out of, of botany 101. And, and except that in DSM, you can have 10 diagnoses, whereas at least in botany, you, you're narrowed to just one plant. Although um, I've been told by a philosopher of biology at Oregon State, Rebecca Sinclair, that species differentiation is much more fuzzy and vague than anyone ever thought. And species are forming and unforming continually. And that our botanical notion of species is way out, outdated. So our, our botanical notion of mental illness is way outdated. That we, if we think indigenously, we're going to think in terms of verbs instead of nouns, that we're going to look at processes instead of things. So becoming, um, becoming so sad and hopeless and helpless that you sit in your room and wanna die is a process. It started somewhere and it's been going on for some time. It's, it's, it's not a thing that fits check boxes that, okay, we say, oh, well, if you've been feeling this way for two weeks and if you've lost all interest in life for two weeks and if you um, have a poor appetite, well, you're depressed. Well, that doesn't help change to happen. And change happens by understanding the story of how we got someplace and co-constructing a story that's embedded in community of how we get to another place. And so story care is, is indigenous mental health care and not thing care. So, so decolonization means that someday when people walk in to see us, instead of saying, my bipolar is acting up, um, they'll say, they'll tell a story. 
of how they got out of balance. And we'll sit together and figure out how, how to find a way back into harmony and balance. How to create a story to introduce order into the chaos that's become their life experience. So um, I love this quote. This is from Ceremony by Leslie Marmol Selka, who's one of my favorite authors. And um, she wrote, I will tell you something about stories. They aren't just entertainment. Don't be fooled. They are all we have, you see, all we have to fight off illness and death. You don't have anything if you don't have the stories. And so we need to bring back stories. We need to bring back stories of how people came to be distressed and how they came to recover, to inspire us and to help us to see the ways that we can restore harmony and balance for people and communities. So it means strengthening cultural identity, integrating programs into community and political empowerment of communities. And <clears throat> so language. In British Columbia, um, within indigenous communities whose language is intact, people there have 55 times less suicide attempts than the total population of British Columbia. However, in indigenous communities where the language is lost, there's 50 times more suicide attempts than the general population of British Columbia. So, wow, language matters. So what are, what are the stories that the elders tell about how people get ill, how they get unwell? And one is inherited trauma, intergenerational trauma. And we know now, <clears throat> we know that you inherit the genetic, uh, the shape of the genes from your parents. And they got them from their parents. It's called epigenetics. And it's actually becoming to be recognized as more important than actual genetics or the sequence of genes for most of the diseases with which we struggle in modern life. Diabetes, heart disease, cancer. Epigenetics is where it's at. And so people who suffer may suffer because their parents suffered and their grandparents suffered. And of course, in indigenous communities, that's the residential schools. Um, it's, um, well, all of these historical traumas, they may suffer from actual trauma to them. I, I um, interviewed a woman today um, who was sexually abused from age three to 12 and um, physically abused, um, just terrible trauma. And um, at, at age 32, she decided to get well. And it was culture and um, elders who made the difference, not the conventional mental health system. Gabor Mate talks about hungry ghosts and uh, elders talk about, um, in Dine, it's Chinli. Um, it's um, bad energy that can uh, get into people, attach themselves to people when they're weak or when they've been shocked or traumatized. Um, the other thing elders talk about is that people get sick, people suffer on behalf of society. When society is out of balance, then individuals 
suffer to show us that there's an imbalance. And we need to be responsive to that imbalance. Some people just grew up with deficient stories for how to live life. And we, we need to teach them better stories. Some people suffer because they're caught in impossible situations from which they have no exit. So this is where the power threat meaning framework comes into play. And sometimes those impossible relationships are double binds in which you lose if you, if you do, do one thing and you lose if you do the other thing, there's no way to win. And so um, what is our mental health system decolonized to look like? Community involvement, uh, elimination of stigma by the recognition of, of suffering people being the canary in the social mind and our having responsibility and responsiveness for them. Radical acceptance creating belonging, uh, building relationships of dignity and respect, ceremony, prayer, spirituality, body therapies, exercise, dance, music, nature, food, plant medicine, better stories, telling one's stories, hearing stories, saving face, traditional stories, intention, visualization, dreaming, safe environment, protection, cocoon. So, those are some of the, of the ideas. And before I stop, I just want to mention um, research domain criteria for thinking about um, human emotional suffering. Because it is a way for two-eyed seeing to join neuroscience and indigenous thinking. So in research domain thinking, um, we think about what are the brain circuits that are involved in a particular uh, symptom and um, what, are, what is the range in which that symptom exists. So it's a really liberating um, concept on the one hand, because if you think about anxiety, anxiety exists in a range and no anxiety can be as problematic as paralyzing anxiety. And so who are the people who die each year at the Grand Canyon? There are the no anxiety young men who jump from rock to rock and miss, or happen to jump on a rock that's barely balanced and it all goes down. So, um, so anxiety exists on a continuum and it's a social construction when we say that a particular place on that continuum is an illness. And we don't actually have to say that it's an illness in order to help people move to a different place on the continuum where they wanna be. And so um, knowing the brain circuitry involved allows us to choose a medication that might help them but actually it also allows us to do other interesting things like transcranial magnetic stimulation you know, to change um, the way, to change the connectivity of brain areas and thereby reduce anxiety. It's the, to reduce anxiety, we stimulate the right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex with a powerful magnet to, um, increase uh, feelings of, of well-being, we stimulate the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex with a powerful magnet. And knowing those brain circuits helps us to think about um, what can be done. But um, pills are not the only answer. And that's also a big part of decolonization. I'll know that we've decolonized people when they stop thinking about pills as being the only answer. And um, so research domain criteria looks at the circuitry involved. And, and it's really cool because it turns out that 
the same brain area can be recruited for different purposes by various circuits. And um, so the amygdala, for instance, is recruited by both the fear and the anxiety, anxiety circuitry. The um, prefrontal cortex, orbitofrontal, orbitoprefrontal cortex is, is recruited by a lot of networks because it's the, the chill brain. It's the part of the brain that helps us to eliminate implausible hypotheses for what's going on. So you see a snake on the path and amygdala says, jump you fool. And orbitofrontal cortex says, it looks more like a stick than a snake. And, it, and amygdala says, oh, all right, well, if you say so. Um, and so um, orbitofrontal cortex is, is an inhibitory mechanism to, to stop us from doing things or feeling things that would be um, bad for us, that would have negative consequences. And um, there's salience network, you know, which is, is impaired in states that we call psychosis. So salience network is what helps us to understand what's important to us. And for some people, um, the Green Bay Packers is the most important thing in the world. Here in New England, it would be the, the New England Patriots. Um, for others, it's um, Mary Oliver and her poetry. And for others, it's, it's going hunting. And we all have different stories about what matters. But the salience network manages those stories. And if the salience network is showing what's called disconnectivity, meaning that it's that the parts of it are poorly connected, then everything can seem important and you can be paralyzed. And if you've ever gone grocery shopping with someone who's diagnosed as schizophrenic, you, you know how difficult that can be. When every word on every label is deeply full of meaning, it gets really hard to just buy some jam and get out of the grocery store. And so if everything is important, then we become paralyzed or not able to function. And, um, you know, there's, there's my favorite part of the brain, which is story brain, which makes stories, understands stories, and, and helps us to negotiate social relationships. And it's called story brain. And it's, it's sadly what disappears in Alzheimer's disease. Story brain goes away. And it's, it's also poorly connected. Its parts are poorly connected in states resulting from high levels of trauma. So trauma results in dysnarrativia, being unable to tell a good story. And healing occurs when we can help someone to put their trauma into a narrative framework that gives it meaning and purpose and, and gives them a sense of um, that it wasn't for nothing a way to uh, feel good about themselves in the face of, of trauma. So, um, so I think that, I mean, I, I really like this research domain criteria way of thinking because I, I, I feel like DSM is colonizing. That, it, that putting these labels on people um, puts a story onto them, that it's, it's a curse, really, that it's just like John Charles said, they've been cursed. And, and so you tell someone that they're bipolar and they go read about bipolar and, and then other people tell them how to perform bipolar and, and pretty soon they're worse off than they were. 
you know, whereas, whereas if I say, oh, you've got a problem where occasionally you stop sleeping and, and you just frenetically uh, make art uh, all day long and, and finally you collapse. And when you wake up, well, it's not that great art. It isn't as good as you thought it was. And you sure do feel down. And, and so really, you know, we just have to keep you from staying up more than 24 hours. Uh, whatever it takes to get you to sleep is, is, you know, what we need to do. And, and so I can, I can manage someone with, with medication or without, without ever having to call them bipolar. I can just focus on, so, so it's the sleep circuitry that's gotten stuck on the, on the off position, can't get to sleep. And we just have to figure out a way to, to reset the switch. And um, it's the same thing that um, a fellow named Schwartz for what's called obsessive compulsive disorder discovered that um, there's a dread circuitry in the brain. And there's a, there's a kind of switch in the caudate nucleus that turns off dread. And if you can't turn it off, you just have to keep checking the oven and checking the lights and checking the door to see that it's locked. And amazingly, he found out that if you can do something to distract yourself for 15 minutes or so, you can, re you can manually reset that switch. And so in his um, therapy, he would have people pick something to do. One, one of his patients sang Yellow Submarine for 15 minutes. Another one did jumping jacks for 15 minutes. Another one ran around the block over and over and over and over for 15 minutes. And, and, and his point was that it didn't matter what they did um, as long as they did it for 15 minutes until the dread went away. And um, at the time, he was, he was having an argument with a, a philosopher named Dennett. And Dennett argued that um, thoughts are like steam from a locomotive, that you can see them, but they don't do anything. And Schwartz said, no, thoughts change the brain. I'll show you. I'll do fMRIs before and after people do my therapy. And it turned out that the, the structure of the brain, the connectivity in the brain changed. Thoughts, changing thoughts changes brain. And um, then it had to agree that thoughts are more than steam from a locomotive. So I'm, I'm getting to the end of this recorded presentation. And uh, I hope people will dialogue with me. Um, and let me see if, let me go to the ends and, and I, ah, oh, yes. There's uh, my email address and my snail mail address and my uh, other coordinates. So um, y'all be in touch now, as we say in Kentucky where I grew up. And uh, hopefully, Someone has listened to me, to the sound of my voice here, and I will stop the recording.